six, employee business expenses. So a couple of things uh, we should clarify before we get begin through the form. First of all, uh, only certain employees may file this form uh, under the uh, current tax law. So if you are not an armed forces reservist, a qualified performing artist, fee basis, either state or local government official, or an employee with impairment related work expenses, you're not eligible to deduct employee business expenses uh, on your income tax return. Above and beyond that, you're only allowed to deduct uh, job related expenses that are considered to be ordinary and necessary to your job. So an ordinary expense is one that is common and accepted in your field of trade or business or profession. A necessary expense is one that is helpful and appropriate for your business. Uh, you can only uh, claim a tax deduction for business expenses that exceed your reimbursements. So you can't be reimbursed by your employer and then turn around and claim that same expense on your tax return as a deduction. And then if you use a vehicle that you're claiming expenses on, then uh, you need to either have owned the vehicle and used the actual expense method in the first year that you used it for business, or you used a depreciation method other than straight line depreciation. We'll get into a little bit more about vehicle expenses uh, in part two. So uh, this tax form is a two-part tax form. Uh, you've got employee business expenses and reimbursements in part one. Uh, but if you're also claiming a vehicle expense, then we would need to complete part two, which specifically covers vehicle expenses. Okay. And then, uh, so we'll walk through this form on behalf of our hero. We'll just put our hero's name, John Doe, and we'll say that he is a qualified, a performing artist. And then we'll put down a social security number. And then we'll come back to the top of part one once we've calculated vehicle expenses uh, down in part two. And then we'll go through the rest of that form. So in part two, there are four sections. There's the general information section, which basically is the information about your vehicle and then you can either choose to uh, apply a standard mileage rate or use actual expenses either in B or in parts section C and then if you own the vehicle and you're claiming actual expenses then you would also complete part D which is depreciation uh, so if you use a standard mileage rate uh, then you don't need to go any further you would simply go through uh, apply the sta standard mileage rate based on your mileage and then you would go from there so and you can use the standard mileage rate only if you uh, owned it, the vehicle and use the standard mileage rate in the first year that you owned it so if this is year four but in year one you used actual expenses and depreciation then you're going to have to use that uh, for the life of the vehicle or if you lease the vehicle and you're using the standard mileage rate for the entire lease period uh, except for any period before 1998 so uh, you cannot use actual expenses for a ve leased vehicle that you've usually that you've previously used the standard mileage rate on so we'll go through both types of examples using the standard mileage rate and then we'll also use um, the um, actual expenses method. So the purpose of this, we'll just say that this vehicle is, we'll, we'll claim for one vehicle and that this vehicle was put into service um, on January 1st of the year. And we'll just say that it was driven uh, a total of 20,000 miles and 10,000 miles were for business. Now the IRS expects you to keep 
some sort of track of business miles versus personal miles if you have a car that you use for either or you know uh, so like if you're a reservist and you're driving uh, to and from your reserve uh, place of duty then you, but you use your car for the rest of the time that that you're not on reserve duty you would need to keep track of at least the reservist mileage and then you can kind of subtract that from the rest of your mileage throughout the rest of the year. There are lots of apps that you can use uh, to track vehicle usage or mileage usage, a log, as long as you keep a consistent uh, record of uh, what you're using your vehicle for and you know what mileage is, is considered business mileage. So uh, 20,000 miles, 10,000 miles of business miles. Um, if you change your vehicle from personal to business use or business use to personal use, uh, then if you don't have mileage for the time before you changed it to business use, you'll need to enter the total amount of miles after the change of business use. So just kind of keep in mind that, um, that the IRS truly expects you to keep track of the business usage usage of mileage. Uh, so uh, in line 15, you're going to enter the uh, average daily round trip commuting distance. So what you would uh, not include is if you commuted to a regular place of, of employment uh, on, a, on a daily basis, that's not business use. Business use would be uh, if you drove to your place of normal employment, then you drove to a third location, you could count that as business use. So for instance of this, we're going to say that as a performing artist, he doesn't really have a commute, uh, a daily commuting distance. Uh, there's, you know, he primarily works out of his house, uh, mastering his craft or trade, and then uh, most of his mileage is based on going to different performance venues. So we'll say that zero miles were for commuting distance and that means zero commuting miles were included in this $20,000 total. And then uh, you would add lines 13 and 16, subtract this total from line 12, and that would be your other mileage. So when we do this, we get 10,000 miles. That would be considered the personal use or if we had commuting miles, that would be the personal use in the commuting miles. Now for uh, the rest of the lines, uh, the if the vehicle was available for personal use during off-duty hours, if uh, just check yes or no. So um, you would say um, that your vehicle was available for personal use during off-duty hours, if, if that's applicable. Do you and your spouse have another vehicle uh, available for personal use. In this case, John Doe does not. Uh, does he have evidence? Yes, he keeps track of all of his mileage in a log, and he can show that to the IRS. Right. So those are all kind of important questions that you should be able to answer truthfully uh, to be able to support your uh, deduction. So we'll go through Section B. And then we'll go back and we'll go through actual expenses and, and calculate them. So uh, in tax year 2022, there was kind of a mid-year adjustment uh, because of inflation. So miles that were driven from January 1st to June 30th, uh, you would multiply those miles by 58.5. And then from July 1st to December 31st, you would multiply those miles by 62.5. So uh, for this purpose, we're going to simply uh, state that half of the mileage was driven in the first half of the year and the second half of the mileage was driven in the second half. And then that way we can kind of just average this out and come up with with an average. So um, with that said, I get uh, $6,050. So 
This means that our hero, John Doe, drove 10,000 miles on business that was not either personal mileage or commuter mileage, and uh, 5,000 miles were uh, at the 58 and a half cent uh, standard mileage rate. At the other half, the other 5,000 was at the 62.5 uh, cent uh, standard mileage rate. So when you combine those two, you get $6,050. That would be a very clean cut way to do it. And again, you, you can only use a standard mileage rate if you've consistently used the standard mileage rate. If, if this was John Doe's first, uh, first year of using the vehicle, uh, what would probably be appropriate is to go back and forth between either the standard mileage rate and actual expenses and kind of make a determination which one you think you'd be better off with. So um, we'll, we'll, keep the, we'll keep this... Uh, up here and then we'll kind of go through the rest of this. So in section C we're simply going to put in actual expenses. So what you know again you have to keep records to be able to substantiate all of this. Let's just say that for all of his miles you know he spent let's see Let's just say for gasoline, oil, repairs, he spent $2,000. Now, if there's any amount that our hero decided to use for a vehicle rental or anything like that, um, then you would put that in there. If you, you know, leased a vehicle, um, there's a table in the form instructions about how you would possibly reduce your deduction by what's known as an inclusion amount. So you might have an inclusion amount if uh, you had a vehicle, like a super expensive vehicle, that the value on the first day of the lease exceeded a certain dollar amount. So if the vehicle on the first day that John leased it exceeded $56,000, then he would have to offset part of his deduction by the the inclusion amount. And IRS publication 463 has more information about how you would uh, calculate the inclusion amount. So, um, and then in this case, you would subtract this, uh, the inclusion amount from line 24A to come up with your deduction for vehicle rentals. We're going to just take a step back and say that John owned his vehicle the entire year. Uh, he did not have a, an employer provided vehicle. So, this would be if 100% if of the lease value was included on your Form W-2. So um, you would be able to deduct that if you, were, if you qualified as an eligible employee. Uh, and then so you simply add lines 23, 24C, and 25. We arrive at $2,000. Now on line 14, we're basically saying that... Um, 50% of this would be what you could possibly deduct as business use, right? So, oh, sorry. So we're going to bring down the, the percentage down here. Multiply the 2,000 by the 50% and we get $1,000. Uh, you can uh, depreciate the value of the car, uh, which we would do in section D, and then we'll come back up here and enter this here. So let's just say that we uh, bought this car for $50,000. Uh, we don't have a special allowance, but we do have, um, we're going to back out half of this. So $15,000 is what we are uh, depreciating. And then in line 33, you would have to calculate your depreciation expense. You can use, um, if you don't use the section 179 deduction of special allowance, there's specific instructions on how, in the form instructions, there's a specific guidance on how to use the special depreciation allowance. Uh, and 
Section 179, which basically gives you the ability to uh, deduct or depreciate, uh, kind of accelerate your depreciation. You can take a lot more than what a straight line depreciation method would, would allow you to. So, um, in, in uh, line 33, you can use uh, one of several depreciation methods. You can either use the 200% declining balance method uh, if the business use percentage is, of the vehicle is more than 50%. Uh, this might give you the largest depreciation deduction for the first three years of the time that you own the car. So since our depreciation percentage is actually exactly 50%, we would not be able to use the decline or the double declining uh, method the in column uh, you could use possibly the 150 percent declining uh, method but again uh, you can only use that if your uh, business use percentage is more than 50 percent so since we are at 50 percent uh, the form instructions tell us that we must use the straight line method and for vehicles, the straight line method is over a five-year period. That means we're going to put in uh, SL, and we're going to put $10,000. Because over a five-year period, $50,000, that's $10,000 per year. Oops, my mistake. Um, I need to back that out because I put in a typo in line 32 and for line 33 we're only going to put the percentage so um, that means according to the form instructions we would put twelve and a half percent um, because this was the year that we placed the car in service. Okay, so uh, basically the year that you place the car in service, uh, even if, so we would depreciate the vehicle 10%, so instead of 20% per year, it would be we place the vehicle in service, so in that first year, even though we put it into service on January 1st of the year, uh, we can only claim up to 12.5%. And the table and the form instructions tell us that from January 1st to September 30th, you can claim a straight line at 10%. And then from October 1st to December 31st, that would be 2.5%. So we can only claim uh, that amount up to, uh, so it would be 10%. Okay. So in line 34, we're simply going to multiply this 10% by the 25,000 and we get 2,500. So because this is depreciating over five years, uh, it'll actually cover six tax years. So in this first year, we're taking 10% of the depreciation. Then we'll have four years of being able to take 20%. And then in that sixth year, we'll take the last 10% um, of, of that depreciation. And over that time, that will be able to come up to this total of $25,000. Um, so since we did not take any Section 179 or a special allowance, this is going to be the depreciation that we take in the given tax year. And then in line 36, we're going to enter uh, any applicable limits. So in the form instructions, uh, there's a limit for what a passenger automobile should be, a truck or a passenger van, and then there are depreciation table limits as to how much depreciation you can take in a given tax year based on either passenger automobiles acquired during certain dates, um, 
uh, trucks. So these tables kind of go on and on and on. So um, if that limitation applies, you'll apply it in line 36. It does not. So we don't need to worry about this limit. We are going to um, enter the amount from line 35 into line 38 and we get 2,500. Now we're going to carry that 2,500 back up to line 28 here. We'll enter it here. And now we're going to add lines 27 and 28. So we're going to take $1,000 from this. We're going to take the $2,500 and we come up at $3,500. So you can compare the actual expenses method versus the standard mileage rate and you can you can come to the, your own conclusion that you might be better off uh, using the standard mileage rate. If you do do that, then you're going to have to stick with that for the amount of time that you use your vehicle for, for, uh, for employee expenses. So once you make a decision in your first year of placing it in service, you're kind of bound by that. Uh, so you might want to actually kind of take a take a step back and think about how you will be using this. Like if you are a reservist and you have a pretty high mileage rate, but you're going to change your uh, your drill location to a location that's a little bit closer, then that might have an impact. Or if you plan to turn in your car after three years instead of keeping it for ten years then you might be better off taking a standard mileage rate deduction if you're just going to drive it until it falls apart right because you can you know you can keep using a standard mileage rate even after you've you know normally would have stopped depreciating so you might have to talk with your accountant or kind of think a little bit more than just the immediate uh, tax year to determine which uh which rate would be best for you. So in this situation, we're going to use the standard mileage rate. We're going to take the 6,050 and we're going to drop it up here. And, uh, and we're going to go through part one, starting with step one. So um, if you are a rural mail carrier, you can treat the amount of qualified reimbursement that you received as the amount of your allowable expense. Uh, because your qualified reimbursement is paid under an accountable plan, your employer should not use the amount of reimbursement in your income. So um, this probably applies to you know, a very small percentage of the population. Uh, virtually everyone else can disregard those instructions. So now we're going to take a look at all other expenses involved. So these are just arbitrary numbers, but if you actually are putting them in, you should keep good track, good books, uh, records of you know your parking fees and transportation. So if you drove your vehicle, but then you ended up taking a commuter train, you know things of that nature, uh, a commuter train as long as you weren't commuting to work. Uh, so um, you know if you you know, decided to drive to a train station because your gig, in John Doe's case, uh, was in a different town 500 miles away, and he didn't put those miles on his car. He simply just bought a train ticket. That's perfectly fine. You can uh, still capture all of that in employee business expenses. So we're going to say that our hero put in $1,000 of other expenses when it comes to parking fees, tolls, transportation, things of that nature. And then... Uh, travel expense while away from home overnight. So this is airfare, car rentals, lodging, everything except for meals, right? So let's just say that he spent $2,000 on that. Uh, and then you, you would total up all of your business expenses and we get 9050. Now, this is everything except for meals because meals have a, a specific um, treatment. So you can enter your allowable meals expense and you would include meals while you're either away from your tax home overnight and then other business meals. So the standard meal allowance 
is based on the federal government's uh, meal and incidental expenses rate. You can claim it under that method. And there's, if you go to gsa.gov type uh, forward slash per diem, you can actually find what the federal meals and incidentals rate is. Or you can keep track of the cost of your meals. So um, we'll just say that for all of these uh, purposes, we'll say that John Doe spent $500 on meals. Oh, sorry. I meant to total this up on line six. Um, if you had any other business expenses that you weren't otherwise including on line, uh, lines one through three, uh, then you would put them in line four. So this would be, you know, business gifts, education, trade publications, uh, anything that's covered under IRS publication 463 or IRS publication 529, um, you would not include meals or taxes or, or, or entrance, interest expenses. So if this is your only entry, um, you, you can't claim anything on Form 2106 unless you are a performing arts, like if you're claiming business expenses as a performing artist, if you're claiming expenses uh, for performing your job as a government official, or uh, if you have impairment-related work expenses as a disability. So if you were deaf and you needed to purchase uh, specific equipment to help you uh, with uh, communicating with hearing people on business calls, like a Sorensen device, then you would use uh, you would use this form to claim that expense. So uh, we're not claiming any of those expenses here. We're simply totaling up uh, everything from uh, line six and line, uh, column A, which is you know line six, and then column B, five hundred dollars. Um, if you weren't reimbursed for any expenses, then you would skip line seven. You would enter these amounts on line eight. So line seven contains any reimburses that you received from your employer that were not reported to you on your W-2. Uh, you would include any reimbursements with a code L in box 12 of your form W-2, which basically means there's a reimbursement that's subject to tax. So we're not claiming any reimbursements, uh, so we're going to simply carry these um, lines down from line six. So in column A, we're going to enter the amount from line eight, and in column B, we're going to, um, so let's do that. In column B, when it comes to meal expenses, generally you can only deduct 50% of your total meal expenses. So uh, you can deduct 100% of meal expenses uh, provided by a restaurant uh, for meals uh, in tax years 2021 and tax years 2022. So uh, that was part of the tax law change uh, for those two tax years. Since this is for tax year 2022, we can go ahead and put the full $500 in here. Uh, going forward in 2023 and further, unless there's a change in the tax law, you would have to multiply this by 50%. And then we simply add the totals. We get uh, 9550. Uh, you can enter that on Schedule 1 of your Form 1040, Line 12. Uh, for employees with impairment-related work expenses, uh, you, uh, if you qualify, you may enter that part on Schedule A, line 16, uh, for Form 1040 line, uh, filers, or Schedule A, uh, line 7, for 1040 NR filers. So uh, you can choose whether or not you put this heat, uh, on Schedule 1 or on Schedule A. And depending on your tax situation, there's there might be benefits to either one. 
So that's all we have for this tax form. Uh, uh, you can uh, go through this step by step in an article that we've created just on employee business expenses. Simply go to our website, teachmepersonalfinance.com, type in IRS Form 2106 in the search bar, and you should see our article. If you like our articles, uh, please subscribe to our newsletter. If you like our YouTube videos, please join. You can either uh, just subscribe to see new videos. You can join our membership uh, where you have access to additional uh, perks and privileges uh, above and beyond that. So um, if you have any questions or comments, please uh, feel free to ask and, uh, and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.